This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Thursday noon, folks. Ted Rolson here in our ThinkTech studios downtown Honolulu with our show, Where the Drone Leads, so we bring to the public and to our uh, trusted uh, viewers the, the current stories, breaking news, and, and inf information, and uh, in really critical information for them on the world of uh, drones, droneism, and where it's all going, which is what we call Where the Drone Leads. With us on the show today, far away in Las Vegas, by the magic of duct tape, cell phones, and Skype, we have with us uh, Hawaii's own Chuck Devaney, uh, UH graduate and uh, UAS entrepreneur at large, uh, currently living in Las Vegas after uh, sampling the life in Washington, D.C. And, and such, which is where you go after you graduate from UH, apparently. And standing next to him is Dr. Trent Lukasik, who is the president of uh, Flightwave Aerospace and is sitting on and bursting with information for us on a release uh, to the public of a brand new hybrid trike copter excellent new configuration drone so we'll hear all about that in a minute but you guys are standing backstage we can see the equipment behind you at the las vegas convention center where the inter drone is taking place and uh the uh carts moving things around so inter drones in its uh, first or second day right now uh for this this year tell us uh, what kind of uh, what kind of moods and what kind of themes what kind of uh, sense are you getting from the directions that are coming forth from the discussions at InterDrone. Go ahead and take that one, Trent. I'm going to be the human tripod. All right. Hey, pleasure to meet everybody. I'm Trent Kotick, and yeah, that introduced me. I'm co-founder, president, and CTO of uh, Flightwave Aerospace System. Um, it's been a really distinct pleasure to be able to work in Hawaii before. We've been there a couple of times with early, early prototypes. Um, and the one we got here today is, is one of our you know, evolution of a lot of our operations that we've done uh, there in Hawaii. Um, the drone floor, the inter-drone ex exhibit floor today is really busy. It's uh, full of excitement and a lot of, a lot of people that are running around just trying to learn more about it. I think one of the things that's been really interesting to see um, is the mix of not just the, the individual sectors or elements in the value chain of drones, the, the companies that are making, making the tools, the, the components, the cameras, the, the software to make it work, but also there's a lot of people running around here who are looking for drone solutions because they're trying to get a small business off the ground with drones as one of their key components. So it's a really awesome mix of, uh, and really big buzz uh, of all the people that are just trying to solve problems here. Well, that's, that's um, pretty cool. So you have the problem owners who come in looking for a solution, and you have the people like you who are generating the components of the solution. You get people like Chuck who do the analysis and this sort of thing for the data as it's pulled together by whatever sensors you might have. So the whole group is gathered there. You know what's cool to me, and we've talked about this on the show several times in the past, <clears throat> the, the world is starting, <clears throat> pardon me, starting to realize it needs to pull together requirements from a user perspective in order to drive this whole thing in the right direction. And uh, we're starting to see that. I think uh, at the end of the month is the uh, NSI gathering in DC, starting to pull together the technical standards and things. So the business is starting to happen like a business, isn't it? And that, that must make you feel pretty good, Trent, having been in on this for four or five years now and having yeah. a product that is, uh, that is certainly at the cutting edge. Of course, it got partly developed on Lanai and partly developed in Kaneohe Bay, so you would expect it to be on the cutting edge as, uh, as it is. So tell us about uh, Flightwave and Edge and how that's all moving forward. Sure, yeah. I started Flightwave right out of grad school. I was working on my PhD at Stanford and met my co-founder there. And right as I was wrapping stuff up, um, I was encouraged by a couple people, including one of my mentors, Phil McGillivray. He works in the Coast Guard as a science liaison and a uh, good friend, of course, Ted's, um, who has encouraged me to try and get uh, a drone for marine applications off the ground here. And uh, so that's, that's kind of where we started. Um, I got into UAVs and drones way back when in 2012 or 2013 when I was part of a project, a research project, that went out to Ofu American Samoa little island in the middle of the Pacific. It's, you know, he kept going from the U.S. to Hawaii on to Australia and stopped halfway. That's where he would find it. Um, but we went out there with a little DIY quadcopter and tried to map coral reef with it. And that was a pretty tough experience for us. The drone wanted, uh, could only fly for 10 minutes. Uh, it was really windy. And uh, every second of the flight of the mission, I was worried about this thing accidentally landing in the water. So fast forward to today, and we're trying to solve a lot of those problems and those pain points with 
the Flight Wave Edge. And uh, Flight Wave Edge is a vertical takeoff and landing airplane. It has a unique configuration with two independently tilting propellers in the front and one very large propeller in the back for endurance and hover. And, and wings, very high aspect ratio wings for endurance and cruise. As an airplane, this vehicle will fly for two hours, uh, which lets you cover a really large amount of area, up to 100 kilometers if you flew in a straight line. Um, so yeah, we, it's a beautifully molded vehicle made out of fiberglass, has some really awesome components in it. It's extremely modular, packs down into a case, and the payloads uh, are also modular, and we've made them uh, agnostic in the sense that our nose cones are are open, and we have a lot of different types of sensors that we can fit in the in the payload in, into the nose cone. So, um, yeah, I actually have a box here uh, with the edge in it. Let's take a look. Can point down right there. Okay. Obviously, we have the we edge the edge. not uh, put together here. Okay. There's a, there's the well, fuselage yeah, component. Yeah, right you get to see it in pieces, and I'll put it together. So this is put these wings in. cameras in it meant for mapping and that goes on the nose here and twist locks like a camera lens like a DSLR camera lens so that's our payload interface so and then so now that's the vehicle this is flight wave edge and I'll back up so you can see the whole thing the vehicle the, the aircraft is a 1.2 meter span vehicle so it's you know tip to tip it's pretty tall yeah <laughs> but uh, yeah the front hey, motors here as I mentioned they tilt independently tilt, and that's how we do hovering, and that's how we control it in yaw. And that's also how we get it set up to fly as a forward flight vehicle. So as an airplane, these two, these two propellers tilt forward, flies as an airplane like that. That is a pretty incredible piece of equipment you're holding in your hands there. You have all the free world's aspect ratio locked up in that one vehicle, so nobody else can claim aspect ratio like you can, which is going to be performance, and it's going to be performance margin. It's going to be uh, thrust margin as such uh, associated with that nice wing you've got there. And this has come a long way since those days at Kuhuku uh, with the first instantiations and that was uh, something in, in, in itself. And then of course over Lanai as well. And it's really interesting that you arrived at this from your own practical experience and your own attempts to solve an environmental problem. So basically extremely uh, personal user needs have been built and baked into this design. And you've got marine orientation, and I think I might have heard somewhere in the past maybe a 40 knot wind uh, criteria built into this. So right. there's, there's just about nothing Mother Nature can throw at you that you can't deal with. That's right, we designed it to be uh, weather tough, weather hardened. Uh, the environment, the marine environment, as I'm sure you all know, is, is, is a really tough place to operate. And, when we set out, uh, we, we tried to pick a technology that would be stress hardened in the marine environment, and figure that if we could handle anything over the water, over the water, we could handle it anywhere. So that, that's that's where we came from. Yeah, Ted is mentioning the old prototypes. These, this thing used to be a, a foamy flying wing with hot glue and, and popsicle right. sticks, essentially. And there might have been uh, some duct tape in there here and there too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and duct tape. The um, but we've this. This vehicle now is, is much more refined. The aspect ratio, is, as uh, Ted mentioned, is really important. It's, uh, I have an aerospace background. I studied aerospace engineering in graduate school, and um, that was one, one of the places where we drew from. We knew that, that uh, high aspect ratio wing translates to high endurance. And, and just the, the big trick, though, when you get to, to make a vehicle like this with the high aspect ratio wing is how do you make the structure strong enough uh, but light enough? some really interesting composite techniques to make this thing uh, really light. So. so that's really great. And you could just even think of embedded sensors in the wings and other things like that to take care of uh, interference between uh, antennas and such. And uh, there's a long future for this yeah. kind of a configuration. Yeah, radios, the radios, and we actually do have some sensors in the wing, like a compass, magnetometers in the wing. So it gets it way out of the way from all the interference of the motors. Mm -hmm. And it snaps together like Legos. Like Legos. Yeah, it's cool. So, and then, then let's switch over to Chuck for a moment. Chuck is uh, kind of a master, in my mind, of the world of, 
of sensor analysis and the software applications that are used to make sense out of what drones and UASs collect. Chuck, how would you see that world evolving, especially when you see something like what Trent has developed here, and how those two come together? Well, it's really nice to see an aircraft with the type of capability to be able to take off and land from the, the deck of a ship and be able to go out and, and uh, do a survey or do a, a location mission, you know, sort of the con ops that the, uh, this particular aircraft was sort of built around. What I'm, my company is moving more towards is advanced video analytics, where we're able to take this information and be able to, um, through computer vision, be able to seek out those objects or colors in the water and uh, radio back to the, uh, you know, command and control center, the location of that object, survivor, uh, and the like. Um, and that's, you know, pretty much stemmed from a lot of the video analytics that our company already does in the gaming industry, using computer vision for facial recognition, um, counting chips on a table, so on and so forth. So in terms of uh, taking advantage of what Trent's done here, uh, you would need a sensor package that supports a, a computer vision analysis routine, and that could be looking at the uh, video stream, it could look, be looking at stills, it could be doing color, it could be doing blob, it could do, be do, doing polygon extraction. There's all kinds of extractions you can create once you have the that, imagery in your hands. And, and that needs to be delivered in such a way that somebody could easily exploit the information and disseminate it to those stakeholders that need to act upon it. So it's quickly, rapidly deploying an aircraft and instantly getting actionable information that uh, is uh, invaluable in multiple verticals and, and applications. So you guys need to go to a bar and on a napkin write down what the payload looks like that would provide that information that can fit into Trent's aircraft. And, uh, and then we need to get it out here, out in Hawaii, where we have uh, needs building every day. And we also would like to get uh, our hands on a few of these elements and products and, and start uh, running them through functional and reliability testing in our fairly extreme and uh, challenging environment out here. We have the high winds, the high vertical shears, we have the saltwater intrusion. So the very things that, that uh, Trent's designed for, we ought to put them to test out here uh, as soon as we can get our hands on one, Trent. Working really fast to do that for you, man. Okay. It's funny you mentioned a bar. We got all these drink tickets that we got to use here. So. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so the napkin in the bar will do well. We'll let's get back to that in, in a minute after our break here. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solutions. How to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Try a little more, harder than before. We're back, folks. This is the second half of our show, Where the Drone Leads. Uh, Thursday afternoon here in, in Honolulu, and a little bit later Thursday in Las Vegas. Uh, Nevada, where Chuck Devaney, our Hawaii expatriate, and Trent Lukasik, who is the president and CEO and uh, founder of Flightwave Aerospace, are standing by. And they're at the Las Vegas Convention Center. They're apparently not in the slot machine area, because you don't hear that traditional noise going on. And they're apparently not on the, uh, on the uh, show floor, because there's exposed pipes in the background. So exactly where are you in the convention center? Looks like the loading dock, Ted. A loading dock, okay. Well, that's kind of interesting, because a loading dock is what you need when you're shipping product. And that's about what you're getting ready to do, shipping product. So we were talking uh, before the break about how what the two of you do can come together nicely in a, in a sort of a, uh, a full service solution for those who are running around the very convention center looking for solutions. 
Yeah, and there's definitely a lot of people showing up with a lot of different products to address just that, the, the all-encompassing, all-in-one solution. And I think more and more people are realizing how part of a task that actually is to have an all-encompassing, all-in-one aircraft that's able to fly in multiple uh, environments, whether you, it's wind, salt water, uh, heat, potential rain, and the like. Um, and I think what we have here, Ted, is, is, uh, is as close as you're going to get to that to what that solution is, especially in terms of the acquisition component. So let's, if somebody wants to get one of these, Trent, what do we do? How do? Who do we tell them to go see? Sure, yeah, we have a website. We have it listed there and available for a pre-sale campaign, flightwave.aero, like an aeroplane, flightwave.aero. So flightwave.aero. Uh, you'll, you'll find the edge, the flightwave edge listed um, for a $1,000 deposit on a $7,500 airplane. So the okay. airplane itself, which is a whole kit, includes the box that it comes in, a nice hard carrying case with the foam inserts, as well as the airframe, wings, the propellers, two batteries, charging station, a controller actually, a controller with an integrated tablet in it to help you pilot it. And then on top of that, you customize it with the payload. There's lots of different payloads that you can choose from. So go and check out the website at flightwave.aero and you can pre-order oh, you pre your, your, your drone there. Okay, so that's good. So, and for a measly seventy-five hundred bucks, you get the capability that would probably cost seventy to a hundred thousand bucks even four or five years ago. Sure. And uh, how about the yeah, software? Yeah, a lot of work to make it like that. How about the analytics and the software and the pieces that uh, follow from the collection of the data? Sure. Yeah, the, this drone is meant as a as a starting point for all of that. Uh, we do our best to integrate the data that comes down to, uh, and plug it into the next step of, of the value chain, meaning uh, our data gets conditioned, the pictures that you get, for example, if you're doing a mapping mission, the pictures get geolocated, and uh, you're able to pass that on to your analytics solution after that, whether it be X4D if you're making a map or, or other, other kind of solutions that you might be working with. Um, obviously, something that we're always interested in learning more about and integrating into new analytics solutions. and. Uh, this is maybe one of the reasons also we're, we're working with UH and trying to uh, figure out how to do some really awesome projects on, on that topic. And that's a piece that's going to go on for a long time and keep developing. That's the whole side of the anal analytics side of this game. And that's, again, what Chuck represents. So having the two of you guys meeting and talking together is uh, probably going to generate something that uh, uh, those of us who can just uh, be amazed at what you do are going to produce something for us in the next six months. Yeah, I have to agree, Ted. I have to agree, and um, there, there's no no time better time than the present, and that's actually something that we're working towards right now. We've got a we've got a really uh, well established, uh, well educated team of developers on board, um, ready to tackle the issue. Okay, and the, the issues are interesting. They're they're not just the issues associated with collecting information and doing something with it. We also have the traffic management issues, the uh, sense and avoid or see and avoid. And we have the issue called counter drone that we all have to think about. So it'd be really interesting to see how those two products you've got here, Chuck on your an analytics side and Trent on the hardware side, how they play in that future role. I just, we, we just challenge people all the time. Take Honolulu. Chuck knows it very well. Trent knows it very well. Imagine two drones over Honolulu today. No big deal. You can find the note of them. You can probably figure out who they are. Ten drones over Honolulu. Well, this is getting kind of complicated, especially if you're the power company and you own eight of them and the other two aren't yours. Or we had a reefing, a grounding situation on the reef here a couple of some some time ago. A uh, the reef was being looked at prior to and after the vessel was removed because you got to go pay someone to repair the reef. And uh, a drone operator was hired to go do that work. A second drone operator, not hired to do the work but copying the first one was in there, collecting the same exact imagery with the idea of undercutting the other guy. So business in its often twisted forms is starting to show up. But imagine if we had 500 drones over Honolulu. Exactly how are we gonna manage them in a traffic management sense when some are in delivery, some are collecting information, some are just out for a recreational ride. So uh, thinking that whole complex adaptive system and how that's all going to be affected by the sensors and the capabilities of the aircraft. In fact, Trent, this is cool because I do believe that uh, I read somewhere that uh, 
One of the issues we've faced in the unmanned traffic management area is inadequate performance to recover from missed waypoints or from a sudden emergence of a strong wind or a penetration into the flight area by some unknown uh, bogey. So having a lot of cross-range performance and a lot of performance margin, such as what you've got, is maybe going to be one of the key factors that enables unmanned traffic management in the future. Yeah, so. it's funny you bring that up because I was sitting on a panel yesterday about sense and avoid, uh, and we were talking a lot about UTM and uh, you know, unmanned traffic management and ACAS, which is uh, airborne collision and avoidance systems. Uh, so it's a lot of things going on. Obviously, with our vehicle, it's, it can fly a long way, and we'd like to be able to fly at the online of sight. That's maybe one of the reasons that we got into marine space as well, is because over the ocean you get to do, it's a lot more safe to fly far away because uh, there's less things to run into. But uh, definitely with the endurance and the range that we can do, we're really interested in how we can make this vehicle fit in the, in the airspace and fit in safely. It's going to be an interesting problem because we don't have, it, it's a small vehicle and we want to be able to, we, we don't want to have to add a lot of sensors on top of it to make it uh, play well in the airspace. So. I think it's going to involve a lot of participation in terms of a centralized system that knows where all the aircraft are. But we'll see how that works out. And that's a really interesting situation. We don't think we have that today anywhere near that in the manned aircraft world because we operate by separation and by assignment, which is not necessarily the best way to handle the UAVs. But I like your idea. Start over the ocean where the risks are low and the ranges are long and get something to work there. It's kind of the crawl, walk, run approach and then bring it ashore kind of like man, right? We emerged out of the ocean and slithered ashore at some point in time and then grew legs. And so we're copying in that same, in that same exact direction. Definitely, yeah. Good model. And so Chuck, but this goes back to you also. The whole world of unmanned traffic management needs, desperately needs the uh, analytical component in order to make it function. And all the things Trent's talking about, the setbacks and the uh, uh, the, the pulled-out zones and all the things that are going to be required to prevent things from running into each other. Uh, even maybe some synthesis where you don't have sensors. I haven't really thought about that, but that also leads to modeling and simulation as a way to you know, characterize what's happening from a trend perspective. So, Trent, we have trends to worry about. Absolutely, and you know, there's a lot of work going on. Obviously, Trent was on a panel today, and, and uh, I unfortunately wasn't unable to attend that, but you know, there's other sensor components that could still be useful. For example, there's a group called Planar Monolithics in Maryland who are working on a, uh, uh, a radar system for a collision avoidance. And as you know, you know, radar really doesn't discriminate in terms of its capability. It can see in the dark, it can see in the rain, it only really gets affected primarily by temperature, I believe. Yeah, yeah, well, there, you know, Trent knows more, but you know there are you know there, we we have a ways to go. I think is what I'm getting at before we're we're actually there. But I've been really impressed how small the radars have gotten in the last two years. In fact, when we first started this, we were doing a little background research on what we could get our hands on, and definitely was thinking this was going to be a long horizon. Uh, what, what used to be uh, like a five or ten pound system is now down to 600 grams in some cases. Still not small enough for us, but uh, it's getting really close. And obviously, there's some some vehicles where 600 grams makes a lot of sense, especially for the bigger ones. Once we get our hands on a few, we can start seeing what we've got out here from uh, uh, sensor payload systems that might assist. Uh, we have colleagues in the U UH and also research areas in the UH that are doing dealing with very small radars down in the, you know, the 50 gram domain, such that uh, instead of making them uh, articulated, just put multiple units on there to get the right uh, coverage. So there's, uh, this is all developing in that direction, as you say, and of course the algorithms that read the radar and decide what to do with it, with it uh, are interesting, and combining acoustic and radar and visual and thinking of the algorithms that do all that, uh, that's where Chuck comes in again. We have the algorithms, which it doesn't weigh anything. It weighs as much as the Raspberry Pi, perhaps, but you can keep adding it on. So capability can keep growing as we begin putting the analytic layers on top of the sensor sets, and uh, the future is just like wide open, especially for students, especially for kids who want to see things move fast from an idea to its inception, as opposed to the normal pace of the aerospace industry. I mean, you mentioned yourself, Trent, three or four years in this game, and you've gone from uh, some uh, foam and fabric and, uh, and tape to a really nifty composite, uh, well-designed system with, again, all the free world's aspect ratio locked up. Nobody else can get it. 
And uh, in, in that's a very short time. You could never do that in the full-size uh, aerospace environment. So there's a lot of rapid reward. There's a lot of rapid learning. There's uh, almost a scrum approach towards life as, as uh, in, in this domain. So, and, and that's where Chuck and his guys come in because the software work is going to be certainly in that same uh, timeliness of six-week type responses to problems. So what a great uh, a great future is in front of a lot of us, and uh, uh, especially for the kids that are coming up in high schools and in colleges. And uh, we will absolutely be encouraging our kids when we get our hands on our first two uh, edges out here in a, in a very short time and put that into the middle of our NASA work and put it into the middle of our environmental work and even our probably our public safety and law enforcement work. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, it can't, uh, it, it can't uh, not also uh, cheer up the side that's going to take care of all the analytics for us. And uh, so we'll, Chuck will depend on you for that. <laughs> and uh, so, and I'll uh, depend on my team. There you, there, you, there you go, your team. And that, you know, another collaboration, getting all this stuff to work. In, unless we all collaborate and share ideas, uh, the, the situation will kind of bog down into proprietary solutions or such. So I think you guys are great at the, at the front edge of that, pushing in the direction for collaborative and shared solutions with open architecture and such. So. Anyway, uh, we are approaching the very end of our show. Trent, first timer on the show. Thanks so much, Trent Lukasik, the president of the founder and originator and great thinker in the world of uh, really clever solutions to complex problems. I uh, really appreciate what you've done there. And of course, Chuck Devaney, uh, uh, master and entrepreneur of uh, UAV operations and, and uh, missions and anal analytics. Uh, thanks very much for joining us from the Las Vegas convention, uh, the, the back room at the Las Vegas Convention Center for the Interdrone uh, show for this year. And we'll see you guys again on the show. And uh, once again, thanks very much for, for being with us today. Really appreciate being on. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad I was part of it. You bet. Thanks, Ed. Okay, see you guys.